the world will never really come together without a savior. We're gonna finish a verse today. And Psalms in the 1640s. It's time for Bible Discovery TV Quick Study. Stay there as we go through the Bible in one year. Coming up now. Hey, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Hembry. And I'm Janice. Welcome to Quick Study, Bible Discovery TV, where we go through the Bible. 66 books written by 40 authors over thousands of years, and yet all with the same theme. And we go through it because we can learn from it. One of the things we learn as we study today in our reading assignment, if you have your power guide, Psalm 133, 106, and 107. We're going to focus on three verses. You know, the world works a whole lot better when we seek God's unity, not man's attempt at unity. The question was asked, can we all not just get along? Well, the answer is no, we need a savior. We'll talk about that and more coming up in just a moment. Corey is also here with Bible Archaeology and History. Corey? Today we are actually going to be talking about some relatively modern history. We're going to be taking a look at the Psalms in the 1600s. Very good. And we also have, do you know, Janice? Yes. Uh, this is a finish the verse since we're in the Psalms. Do you know how to finish this particular verse? He sent his word and healed them. All right, a very good question. If you've watched this program for any length of time, you might know that. So all of this and more is coming up. So stay there as Quick Study Bible Discovery TV continues. the book of Psalms today, there are so many different things uh, that I could bring to you as a study because the Psalms are huge. It's such a big topic historically and linguistically and almost every other way. But right now I want to bring to you something that involves very recent history in the grand scheme of things. Take a look at this. Recently, the biblical book of Psalms has flooded television and computer screens via major news agencies in the form of a printed copy published in 1640. Other than its age, the extraordinary quality of this book is that it is believed to be the first book printed in North America. This antique book is now referred to as the Bay Psalm Book, and there are actually five surviving copies, one of which was going on sale and was projected to sell for millions of dollars, explaining its popularity on the news. Originally, the five known surviving copies were all owned by Boston's Old South Church, itself established in the 1600s. But now, three of the copies are owned by Yale and Brown Universities and the Library of Congress. The history behind this Bay Psalm book lies a few years after the famous Plymouth Landing of the Puritans in America. 30 Puritan ministers together began to translate into English the book of Psalms. Their goal was to create a version that was closer to the Hebrew than the King James Version. They began their work in 1636, and four years later, the Bay Psalm book was printed. Although back then, it was called the whole book of Psalms, faithfully translated into English meter. Amazingly preserved despite being used weekly for years, these copies of Psalms were used as hymnals or songbooks for church services. It's believed that 1,700 copies were printed from Cambridge, Massachusetts on a printing press from London. The five remaining copies are not only cool artifacts from our recent history, they are also a testament 
testament to the unusual ability of scripture to survive. Now, in the course of the history of the world, a few hundred years is really not that much time. And, and it, what really strikes me is the difference of worship culture between 1640 and today. I mean, today we do incorporate scripture into worship music, but it's much uh, more t a verse here and a verse there. But in 1640s, they literally just printed a book of the Psalms and used that as their hymnal. They wrote music to it. So it's really interesting of all the ways that uh, the scripture is passed on to us through history, uh, the Psalms being used as a hymnal is a really, really cool way that this book has survived. As a matter of fact, even in the early church, they did a lot of that as well, Corey. And of course, the, mm -hmm. our Jewish brothers and sisters, they did it. That's how they taught mm -hmm. with Maskell Psalms and all of the rest of it. Very interesting stuff. Thank you. Corey teaches at Bible Discovery Seminary and College. And so if you'd like to learn about uh, Bible archaeology and history, take a course on it, why not visit us at BibleDiscoveryTV.com. BibleDiscoveryTV.com. You know, we put together, Janice, this Revelation DVD, and I had mm -hmm. a great time doing it. Mm -hmm. And I, we're going basically verse by verse through the book of Revelation, 22 chapters. Mm -hmm. So we just finished our latest installment of Revelation chapter 1. And I call it Revelation looking into the face of God literally the face of Jesus Christ. So we put the teaching on a DVD video for you and would like to invite you to receive yours. So if you would like to get a hold of this DVD video, uh, teaching video on Revelation chapter one, uh, the first installment of several that we're going to have, then you can write to us for a gift of $25 or more. Now the, the $25 helps us to stay on the air and keep going and we'll be happy to send that to you. If you donate online, then what we'll do is have the DVD or the video ready for you there, and you can actually download it or you can watch it right online once you donate. Now, here is the address, right to P.O. Box 150, Murraysville, Pennsylvania, 15668. 0150. In Canada, P.O. Box 456, Orangeville, Ontario, L9W5G2. Also, if you would like the video DVD on Revelation uh, chapter 1, then you can call at 724 733 8336 in the United States of America and in Canada, 519 940 8338. May I make this suggestion? If you're watching from Australia, we have many people watching mm -hmm. from Australia, many people watching in Europe right now, and the internet, we, our third most visiting country is actually China. Mm -hmm. uh, may I suggest to you make a donation on the internet, and then you can see the video there, or you can download it there. So that's what my recommendation would be. Let's study on. It's time to explore the superheroes of the Bible. You know, one of the smallest psalms in the Bible is also one of the most powerful. Superheroes of the faith know that there are secrets hidden in the Bible for the diligently faithful to find. Psalm 133 was written during the time of King David's reign, probably about 1011 to 971 BC, and David's kingdom building had taught him a very important thing. Psalm 133 is frequently credited to David and unveils four secrets from heaven which unity brings to earth. Unity, however, is not the absence of good and healthy conflict, but the presence of absolute purpose. Since God is our creator and he is the only one who can give us divine purpose, unity only comes as his mind and his desires are planted in ours. Psalm 133, verses 1 through 3. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head, running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron, running down on the edge of his garments. 
It is like the dew of Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, life forevermore. Psalm 133, verses 1 through 3. Rod Hember here, Bible Discovery TV Quick Study. Thank you for staying with us. Today we talk about unity. Now, I find it interesting that in a world with a proliferation of communications, I mean, we've never been able to communicate as well with each other around the world as we have in today's world. I mean, we got Facebook, we've got Twitter, we've got the internet, we've got all these social networks. You know, we've got for the professional community, LinkedIn, and we've got all of these things. And yet we have so much conflict still. Mankind still seeks unity. And so on this program, we're going to study Psalm 133 and focus specifically on what this means, because there is a very short psalm of three verses that helps us to understand a little bit. Let's take a look at the overview as we focus on this. We're going to be talking about strong unity. Now, our reading assignment is Psalm 133, Psalm 106, and Psalm 107. We are going to focus specifically on Psalm 133. Now, God has a high view of unity. But beloved, may I say at the beginning, you cannot have any unity with each other until you have unity with your creator and with God. And that, of course, is what the gospel message is all about. The gospel message is about restoring the relationship between man and God that sin has corrupted. That's what it means to be born again, that we are no longer enemies of God, that we are now his children. The Redeemer has restored us. We talk in theology be about the regeneration of the mind. It's very interesting. Let's take a look at the first passage here in Psalm 133. Get your power guides out. Now there are four, point in, four points in your power guides. We're going to deal with three of them here on the program. So in Psalm 133 verse 1, written at the same time that we're studying in ancient Israel, it says this, Behold, now anytime you see the word behold, that means take note. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Now, of course, we all know that. That is, in fact, the, the idea here. That's the question that needs to be answered when we have racial violence. And the question is, why can't we all just get along? Everybody desires unity. Recently in Canada, part of the elections in the province of Quebec was whether or not there would be more people who want to separate from Canada rather than those who want to stay together. And overwhelmingly, the political frontier there changed to we want to stay together. Now that's interesting to me and fascinating and actually very good. But the point I'm trying to make is this idea of unity often eludes us, but God himself says it is good. So here ends the first point. Beloved, it goes well and good when God's men and women dwell together in unity of purpose upon this earth. It brings power and peace. Now notice there that we are talking about unity of purpose. Remember that we're not all going to think the same. And God does not want us all to think the same. He, he is diverse. His personality cannot be contained into one personality type. And so God doesn't desire us all to be exactly alike. He created a great variety. Look at the creation. I mean, the different color of birds and all the different things going on. God expresses himself through great diversity. But the purpose of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the purpose of God in serving him brings the diversity together in university or unity. As a matter of fact, that's what the word university really means is unity in diversity. Now let's go on to the scripture in verse two and we read from Psalm 133 this, here is the word of God. It is like precious oil upon the head running down on the beard and the beard of Aaron running down on the edge of his garments. Now here God through this Psalm 133 shows us the divine picture of unity. It's fascinating. Here's the point. As we focus on this, the specific point is this, and we'll put it on the screen. There is divine supernatural power when we work together around God's purposes, not our own. You see, one of the problems that we have in today's world, and especially in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, is we're all about us. It's all about the individual. It's all about my ministry and my giftings and my, 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 my. And at some point, beloved, God desires us to work together as one body. 
Now, it's interesting to me that in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul the Apostle says that do all speak in tongues? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all have gifts of prophecy? Do all have gifts of wisdom or gifts of faith? It's a rhetorical device. The answer is no. And then he says that God desires us all to use our separate giftings to work together. Yet there are some who would say that we all need to have this gift or that gift. But God gives gifts according to what His Spirit does, not what we want. And so, beloved, may I encourage you today to enjoy the diversity of gifts that the Holy Spirit has given to the church and work together. Don't compete with each other, but work together. Get behind God's desire to save humanity on this planet and work that way. Work under one purpose. We go on in the scripture in Psalm 133 in verse 3, it is like the dew of Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion. For there, for there the Lord commanded a blessing of life forevermore. What an interesting point. Here it is. As we focus on the function of the word, let's look at the world functions well, and healing comes to those around us when we work to seek God's unity in our churches instead of competing. Beloved, uh, we all know that the, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is to demonstrate what it means to come together as one people under one God. It's all over the Word of God. Uh, he wants diversity, 12 tribes of Israel, but he wants one nation, Israel. He has 12 apostles, but he has one church. I need you to understand that God desires us to show the rest of the world what it means to work together. So. My advice today based on this scripture is simply stop thinking about your ministry and think about God's ministry and work together. have this false idea that if you're a Christian, you only have to read the New Testament. The Old Testament is just, you know, bonus reading material. Now, if you've watched Quick Study before, uh, you know that I talk about this a lot, that that is not true, that really the Old Testament is the foundation on which Christ stood. Right now, we're going to give an example of that, but this time through the book of Psalms. The Book of Psalms has long been taught by Jewish rabbis and later by Christians to contain prophetic references to the Messiah. Jesus himself quoted the Davidic Psalms. Famously, he quoted two Psalms while being crucified. The first is from Psalm 22, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Psalm 22 was written by King David. It's an astounding account of what would happen a thousand years after David to the Messiah. The first half of the Psalms records the suffering of the Messiah, including details of his pierced hands and feet and men casting lots for his clothes. The second half of the Psalm sees a victorious Messiah standing alive in the great congregation. The Gospel of Luke also has Jesus quoting from Psalm 31, Into your hand I commit my spirit. Jesus had earlier in his ministry used a direct quote from Psalms to answer a question posed by the Pharisees. In Matthew 22, the Pharisees ask Jesus whose son the Messiah is, expecting him to answer David as the Messiah was to be his descendant. But instead, Jesus answers from Psalm 110. The Lord declared to my Lord. Here we have David speaking of the Messiah as his Lord, not his son, an answer that quieted the Pharisees and pointed to the divine nature of the Messiah. Other famously messianic Psalms are Psalm 2 and 16. Psalm 2 speaks of the Messiah as the anointed one of God, twice as the son of God, and a king over Israel and the Gentiles. Psalm 16 speaks of unusual protection for the Messiah. He will not be abandoned to death, and God will not allow him to see decay. The apostle Peter quoted from that passage in Acts 2, relating it directly to the resurrection of Jesus Christ.
This ministry is supported exclusively by our Discovery Partners. Discovery Partners are viewers who have joined us by giving a monthly offering in any amount. We have no other source of income except the regular giving of Discovery Partners. When you do give, we will automatically send you our Bible Power Guides every month. 32 pages of Bible commentary that match the daily programs. These guides also contain the unique reading plan of Quick Study. Join us today and become a part of the Bible Discovery Team. Now is the time to bring God's Word to our troubled world. Send to P.O. Box 150, Murraysville, Pennsylvania, 15668-0150. In Canada, P.O. Box 456, Orangeville, Ontario, L9W5G2, or call 519-940-8338 in Canada, or 724-733-8336 in the USA. You can also support at www.biblediscoverytv.com. Thank you for staying with us, Rod Henry here along with Jan, and we are continuing our study through the Bible. Now, next time on Quick Study, we're going to be focusing on 2 Samuel chapter 6 through 7, Biblical Secrets to Bringing the Holy Presence of God to Our Lives. It's going to be a good one. So we hope you'll stay there for that. Janice, yes. um, a couple of quick things before mm -hmm. we get to do you know, just to mention, we had some ladies last year go through the journey through. Yes, we did. And, uh, they, man, these, and so the journey through is a program where you go through the whole Bible with us mm -hmm. on uh, the 2013 programs. And then you sent out these tests. Man, That's they right. did these tests. They certainly did. And you're going to be hearing about those ladies in a few days. So we've got certificates for you ladies. And uh, we're very impressed with the work that you've done. We've mm -hmm. seen it. Uh, very interesting. So the, watch for that. Okay. Do you know? Well, we continue to challenge our minds, and these are some of my favorites when we're going through the Psalms. We're going to finish the verse. So here's the first part of the verse that I'm asking Corey and you viewers at home to fill in. Here it is. He sent his word and healed them. And delivered them from their destruction. Absolutely right. So and where's that it found? Is Psalm 107:20. And if you've been a viewer of Quick Study for any length of time, you will hear us quote that one often because that's actually one of the founding verses um, that Quick Study was built upon. He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. And over these 23 years, we have seen just here in Canada, we have seen that proven over and over and over again, not only with our lives, our family, but also in the testimonies that you send to us uh, on a daily basis. We read your mail. Um, uh, some of you have been with us right from the Brampton days in the old studio there uh, when your sister Robin was a part of the program as well. I need and, to take uh, you on a time capsule. All right. Okay. All right. So a lot of people come to visit us in Orangeville mm -hmm. and they say, I remember your dad when he was the pastor at Kennedy Road Tabernacle in Brampton, Ontario. We mm -hmm. get that all the time. But even prior to that, my father was the associate minister for Rex Humbard in Akron, Ohio. That's right. yeah. And he started a 15 minute daily radio program called Rejoice. Mm -hmm. I was the engineer of that program and that was the founding verse. Now, let me tell you the time capsule. Okay. We're going back to 1975. So we started with that call to go through the Bible and teach on the Bible in 1975 mm -hmm. on a radio program, 15 minute daily radio program called Rejoice. And through the years, it kind of grew and grew and grew. And then in 1990, President George Bush Sr. declared it the year of the Bible. That's right. And uh, so that's when we started the Quick Study program. That is a blast. Way back in From time. the past. It is. When I first met you, you were doing <laughs> Rejoice with your dad. Okay, we need to talk about that on the next program, okay? But I need to give you the address and remind you that you can write for your Quick Study Power Guide. And that is the bread and butter of this program. It is a, it's written from my heart to yours. It helps you go through the Bible, has the reading assignment in it. It also comes with a discovery letter. And so when you support us in any amount, you can do that online or writing to us. Here's the address, P.O. Box 150, Murraysville, Pennsylvania, 156680. 
0150. In Canada, P.O. Box 456, Orangeville, Ontario, L9W5G2. Also, you can call us at 724-733-8336 in the United States, 519-940-8338. And remember to send your prayer request. Here is Call to Prayer. Most modern churches have a dim and distorted view of the unity in Christ in this selfish society. Unity is not the stronger dominating, force feeding the weaker. Unity in marriage is not subjugating a spouse to dominating, controlling spirits in the name of Jesus. Unity begins with personal servitude. There is great strength for life when we learn that unity in the church with all of its blessings begins in the heart of the individual. There can be no unity with others if we are not in unity with God's desires and purpose in our lives. So God's idea of unity is servitude from each of us to our Lord. With that we pray, Lord teach me that unity begins with me and you in my heart. I surrender. In our Strength in Your Mind segment today, a great question for you. Where does the Bible teach that unity will take much work, but we should endeavor to accomplish it? What a great question. If you think you know the answer to that question, then I would encourage you to go to BibleDiscoveryTV.com or get on our mailing list because we send those answers out. And these questions will be 312 of them. They make a great way to have fun and conversation pieces and all of that. And we've done them specifically for you. But you know, there can be no unity in your family and your marriage until you have unity with God. Jesus Christ has provided that unity according to the Bible and I believe the Bible. And so beloved, I encourage you today to come to Jesus. You say, well, Rod, how do I do that? I mean, do I have to go to a church and you know, go through a program? No, you pray right where you are and you say, Lord, I believe you died on the cross and rose again and I make you Lord of my life. Pray sincerely and he will come to you. From my family to yours and us here, come to Jesus today. Your personal power guide is waiting for you in our offices. Write today with an offering in any amount and we'd be happy to send it to you. Or you can call at 519-940-8338 or 724-733-8336.